Okay. We're here uh, with Tim from Misfits Attic. Um, you guys made a game called a virus named Tom. We did. Uh, when did that came out? About what, four or five months ago? Yeah, August 1st. Okay. Um, and it's kind of a, a puzzle action game. So we'll put a trailer up with that soon. But we're here to just kind of, um, you know, we're in the Bay Area and there's a lot of smaller game developers that don't have a lot of, um, a lot. you know, there's a lot of small game developers who don't have a lot of uh, attention on them, you know, as much as they should. So we are in the somewhat fortunate position to have some kind of audience, you know, follow our games. So we want to kind of just extend out and kind of combine audiences, combine forces like Voltron and <laughs> yes, yeah, and get things uh, moving that, that way. Awesome. So we're here just to kind of talk about games in general, but we're going to be talking about the, the games that Tim is working on now and a Virus Named Tom. So first, Hugh, do you want to put up a Virus Named Tom, the trailer, while we're... <laughs> And we're back. Okay. Yes. Uh, so that was a virus <laughs> named Tom. Do you want to just like briefly describe? You know, yeah. Sure. It's, I um, guess with the game and also like kind of the process. Yeah. Well, first, thanks for having us on. Yeah. This is really cool. I've come over he, he here was before. Just, he was just saying how he always forgets to, to <laughs> thank like the, and the, you know, so that, that's that. My wife is the kind of art department for our studio. Right. And uh, she, whenever she comes on with me, she does all the thanking and stuff while I'm like ranting and raving about game design and stuff like that, so I'm trying to channel my inner Holly. But, uh, but yeah, no, it's like an action puzzle game. It's basically kind of a merger of the two, which I think like people who love both, it kind of, they love it. And right. people who like one or the other, latch on to one they kind of, they, 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 that was what I was hoping, but it can kind of alienate them too, because it's kind of a puzzle game, because you have that kind of pipe mechanic. You're doing this wrong already. You're not supposed to say it alienates people. <laughs> You know, Hugh would tell you this. It's, yes. it's, it, it really it, it, it synergizes. It synergizes uh, all of their... Everything good in the world is basically right. in this game. It's channeled through this <laughs> game. If you want to experience everything that's good, you should... Yes. Right. Well, actually, you, you play as a virus, so you're actually a horrible person. Uh, not really a person. <laughs> no, you're like... Actually, what's funny is, is that we called it a virus named Tom. Right. And as the game went on, like, your embodiment is this little... Uh, mechanical machine right. with like this little eye that's kind of cute but kind of menacing and there was kind of fun It's more like a that. nanobot, right? A nanobot, yeah, right. Like a nanobot. And so then all of a sudden you're spreading this virus and then I was like, well, you're kind of not the virus sort of and then I'm like, nobody's going to think about that. <laughs> so and forget what I said. I'm I just ruining it. I was just like, I'm just now. moving around the script, putting down bombs. And <laughs> right. Yeah. So basically, yeah, it's kind of like Pipe Mania 
uh, uh, with added puzzle mechanics, right? So like you wrap around the edge of the screen or we have encrypted tiles and all right. that kind of stuff. Uh, and then we added a dexterity kind of twitch mechanic uh, where there are drones that come and you have to dodge out of the way. So it's kind of like you're using your thumbs and your brain, which I always like games like that. And there's also the, um, the drones that have the what are they called? That, that they trail behind them, the, the like the energy. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So That's you, like you have to use energy, and it's kind of like the timer of the game, right? Right. So to get more time, you could take this risk to kind of just sweep right behind an enemy and pick yeah. up the energy they're carrying to extend your time. But it is risky. Cause yeah. You, and when we were designing the game, I think what happened was is that we just found ourselves, because we were playing levels over and over again, that we'd just start messing with the drones, like we'd start like taunting them, kind of like you see like an otter doing with like alligators or whatever in environments. Like it, it's like you see these, there's this taunting that goes on, and we were like, we want to reward the player for acting like an idiot and like waiting till the last second and jumping out of the right, way. Right. And so we came up with this idea that we put energy on the front and the back, and as you gain that, that'll be your higher score. That was also a way for us to say more advanced players that want a higher score. Right. Like that's you beat the level, then you can go back and try and steal all of the energy and that you know achievements and all that kind of wonderful right. stuff. And that was a way for us to, because we were ramping up the puzzle mechanics, and I wanted to ramp up the dexterity mechanics too. I didn't want it to just be like, okay, we're just going to make the drones faster. You know, so we came up with different kinds of drones. And something and I mechanics. I noticed as I was playing is that. Um, I, don't know, I felt like there was kind of two types of levels in the game almost. There was the, at least, you know, the, the initial half of the game or mm -hmm. so, um, the type of level that is more focused on Twitch, right. where the answer is more apparent. Like, I would, I'd would be able right. to figure those ones out pretty quickly, and so then my task is more of the, in the Twitch department, just moving right. around and getting the timing right. I was I was playing co-op at the time, too, so was, right. like, uh, those work around. And then the other, other half of the game is kind of where you're not as worried about the enemies and moving around. It's more right. figuring out the, so did you kind of design the levels with yeah. that? Definitely. Like I didn't. I never like games that have that kind of like Michael Bay effect, where like you know you're just always going and going and going. Right. So it's like I feel like because we have two mechanics, I wanted to I wanted to kind of go between them. So what we would do is we would we would have like a few uh, dexterity levels, like you're saying, and another. Well, so we'd vary between dexterity and, and puzzles, so that you could have a break, and then people that don't like the puzzles as much or got tired and wanted to you know if you get amped up could go, and we'd kind of try and do that. Right. But another thing that I tried to do was just make it so that I felt like if you ramp them both up at the same rate, it, it didn't feel right because what happens is, is that like, um, I found that people love when you give them this incredibly challenging dexterity problem, right? Like, oh my God, these drones are moving so fast, but I only have to move that one piece and I can see that right now, right? Uh, and then the other problem is, is that uh, if you give them uh, a really difficult puzzle, but then there are all these drones flying around right. and they're just getting annoyed because they, they don't know how to solve it's the overload. puzzle. So I felt like either one of those, ramping them up at the same rate, like didn't give the player that sense of progression, that sense of like, this is, oh, I'm doing it, right? And give them that objective. So then later on in the game, I just ramped them both up just to be an ass. <laughs> I see. So um, another, I did prepare some questions, Ooh. but I, I, I told uh, Tim here that I know that he's a talker, so I don't have to prepare right. too much. But uh, one of the prepared questions I had, and while I go and fix the computer that just turned off right there uh, that we're using, um, <laughs> I, I want to know what was maybe like one big lesson you learned during the development of Tom, whether that is uh, just jig jiggle the mouse. Yeah, jiggle the mouse. There's this great game called uh, Space Alert. It's a board game. I don't know if you've played it. This mechanic where it's just it's a real time board game, which is weird, right? It right. It plays in ten minutes, and there's this there's a point where you have to go back to the center of the board, and you have to prevent the screensaver from going off in the spaceship because the spaceship has a screensaver and it will crash operating <laughs> system. So somebody has to go back there and jiggle the mouse. So that's what Max just did for us it's here. It's teaching you real, real yeah, yeah. World. It's, it's that's how things work in the real life. So that. <laughs> That's the, the jiggles when must I, be jiggled. Whenever I think of screensavers, and I always think of that game. But yeah, uh, so, so Max awesome. fixed that for us, or he jiggled the mouse. Um, so what is like one big lesson you learned from making a virus named Tom? Oh or man, lots of lessons to be learned. I think some of the lessons that I learned were in uh, like because we focused on co-op in the game, mm -hmm. uh, and I hadn't I had played a lot of co-op games, but I never designed a co-op game. Um, and we learned, we just learned so much in that space. Like, I think one of the things that I tried to do at first um, was just say, oh, we're just going to add three players. As right. ridiculous as it sounds, I was like... So just kind of scale linearly. Like, we have one player, <laughs> right. there's just going to be three more, and right. the game will just kind of... And the game will kind of scale with that, because, yeah. like, you know, more was people... Was that sort of just the first naive attempt? Like, you knew it was naive, but we're just going to try yeah. it? Yeah. And we're an indie, so we're like, you know, oh, do we really want to make, you know, like, all yeah. this involved... Yeah, a, a big investment. Right. And so, and so, but then once we started doing that, and we saw people play it that way, 
Um, they were having so much fun. Uh, it became really apparent that like we wanted that to be a focus. And then what happened is is that I started trying to make levels that were good for both one and four players. Um, and I'd come up with this really cool level idea where it'd be like, oh, one guy has to do this and the other guy has to do that, but you can't do that in single player. And then we finally made the decision that we were just gonna make 54 yeah. levels of this and 54 levels right. of that, which doubled my workload or whatever. But it made it easier in a way because then Still all of a sudden- to consider all the options. Yeah, I think sometimes when you're trying to, you know, engineer something and take in all these edge cases and right. stuff, it might be easier to just like divide that and- Was there any problem with having a two player level versus a four player or at that point was it pretty at that point it wasn't that bad like i do believe that it would have been fun to make some levels that required four or that I required see. three right. um but i didn't think that that would be i thought i was going to be kind of you know lucky to have like two in there and that was going to be the normal case right so actually that wasn't so bad because usually if there was something like that where this player one would do this and player two would do that, it would kind of break into player one and three would do this and right. player two and four would do that. Natural so, divide there. Yeah. yeah. So um, now I wanted to talk about kind of what you're working on now and something yeah. that uh, Tim and um, his wife have been, Holly, have been posting on YouTube um, once a week has been this kind yeah. of right? This kind of development video. And uh, they're working on these um, prototypes for future games. Yeah. So why don't you tell me about like, first of all, why are you making these paper prototypes? How that, um, you know, do you have the digital version in mind as you're making that? And and Hugh, while we're doing that, you want to bring up um, chest the gathering screenshots. Chest the gathering. Yeah. So we're gonna Which have some is, screenshots up that. Right. Uh, what's going on here? Which is a funny name for a game, and it's not the final name for the game because we don't want to. Uh, <laughs> Run into issues. With you don't want the chess guy suing you. <laughs> no, yeah, that's, that's, that's the problem. That's, you, yeah. that's the, our main worry. The, the, the chess the trademark, chess, I think yeah. it's uh, Those guys Mattel are or something. Like, yeah, yeah. They, they'll come right after you. <laughs> but uh, so they, you can see the screenshot that up there. Oh, cool. So this is um, this is the digital version right here. What we did was we made. A, um, they can't see what you point at, so you can still look oh. at the camera. But yeah, yeah. That's just so you have a reference of what's going on. Here. So this is the, so what we did was we made a paper prototype of this game, and it's basically a mashup of magic and chess and a little bit of D and D. And what we did was we made a, a paper prototype version of it. Um, and then from that paper prototype version of it, we played it and played it and played it. Um, and I don't have the notion or knowledge to make the, a, a, a physical board game. And so we always thought maybe we'll make a video game out of it, which I would think would be really funny if we could make the video game version and that got popular enough that then I could make the board game version. But so it initially was when you were first working work on this, where is it? Um were you doing it more for just fun of making them? Yes. Or, so it, it, yes. And then it kind of, you were thinking of, oh, this could work as a... When a virus named Tom a stopped, like, right. I had done nothing in game design for, like, the last year of my life. Right. Because all we were trying to do is push this game out. So all of a sudden, all these little side projects that I'd always, you know, founded around... The things it, that you gather up as you're working yeah, on the game. Yeah, all of a sudden, they became, like, what is our next title going to be? Right. Um, and so, like, this was one that seemed more like a board game at the time. But uh, but it was really fun making it. So we thought like, oh, let's do a let's do a let's let's bring this around to our indie friends and other game designers. I played it. Yeah. Yep. And like ask feedback. I got schooled. I just got dominated. <laughs> I do. I get mad when I get dominated at it because I'm like I'm explaining the rules as I'm getting my butt kicked. It's like right, that's right. not good. But, so why don't you briefly describe how it plays or what it is? Right. So basically, I think the idea is is that you have these you have these twins that you place down that are basically the representation of you. If either one of them dies, you're toast. Uh, and it's kind of like chess in the fact that you're what you're doing is you're spawning pieces. So you kind of have two kings almost, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. And you're spawning pieces that are basically like a bishop or a rook or a queen or whatever. Uh, but and then like magic, those are based on cards. Right. Like um, and so you'll play them and they'll then what you do And you need to have enough mana to spawn yes, them and that, that exactly type of thing. that type type of thing. And then the idea is is that I didn't want to have a crazy number of characters on the board because chess is complicated. Right. And magic is complicated and I didn't want to combine those two right. and make a twice as complicated <laughs> game. So I tried so take to take the complexity and divide by half and then Yes, add, exactly. But, yeah. So what I did was I just the made order it so operations that is important. Here. Only only like a only diagonal movements or horizontal and vertical movements. Right, right. And then instead of adding a bunch of pieces and giving range because I like the strategy of having infinite range. There's something there's something clean and pure about that. I think. Unless you execute on those like those big moves, like a hail right. mary in some way. Exactly. Ways. So so then what we did was we made modifiers. So what you can do is you can cast a modifier. Like for example, we have ricochet, which you cast on a bishop, which allows him to knock off the edge of the board and back in. Right. Um, and those Rick modifiers kind of create like a more complex game because you're kind of starting with a chess end game. 
because you're starting from like no pieces. Right. So the game, it, it's it's not as crazy as having like the full board, right. but then it gets more complicated because we add in all of these. Which modifiers. I think is very uh, like a you know, modern video games, um, especially like Virus St. Thomas, is a great example. They kind of build up. Right. Like there's a big um, push. You know, I, I think of um, like there's a lot of non-digital games that are not like this. Like you jump into a game of Twilight Imperium or right. whatever, like one of these big yeah. strategy games. And you gotta read that. Someone had to read that book yeah. like a week before and yeah. fully. And it's like, there, there's a there's a big, and I'm noticing this in the, the non-digital space as well. There's a game called Legends of Andor that I was playing over the weekend where they have like a video game style tutorial built in. Um, but yeah, so like I, I could see how you're kind of merging the, the video game concept of right. building complexity with yeah. that um, non-digital Yeah, trying prototype. to. And then we started making it, actually, at that time, we decided we might have multiple... We have, like, a spawn mechanic that's based on, like, a row and a column. Right. And so then I was like, well, what if we had multiple rooms? So that, like, you could only spawn creatures in a room that you have a creature in. And then that way, there's this kind of race to each other's room. Yes. Especially when, because we wanted to make it... Because we just have this obsession with, with four players, I suppose. We wanted to have four players in there. And four what, players... What do you think it is about four players? Well, I think it comes from my NES days, like when you or, or, or like you know old the console SNES, games. I SNES. think because yeah, oh yeah, the NES only had two. Maybe that that comes from the fact that the split screen works best <laughs> works with four. four. Like the five is where you're gonna put the fifth screen. Right. Three the three players you have that weird extra right. empty space that <laughs> yeah. maybe like that's the the genesis of the four players. It could be. I also think of it as like from a board standpoint. Just initially when we placed the cameras in the digital version, mm -hmm. it's just the board just because it has rooms has like kind of four yeah. sides so we place like camera one camera two camera three camera four maybe that's where nice. it also comes from because originally actually i think originally when i designed this game i was thinking of like uh you know what if you had a chess game this is back in the day like if you made chess multiplayer right uh, and i was like that's what it would be is it's almost like take the two the row of two where you have all your pieces and sink it back a little bit and then the square is the space so maybe that's where that was originating from this is not entirely related, but have you heard of Chess 2? No. Chess oh, oh, no, I think I have heard of <laughs> Maybe Chess I talked to you about it, but Chess 2 is the um, David Serlin, which is a, another local, um, he's working on non digital games right now. But at some point, he developed Chess 2, which is a sequel to Chess, right. which is funny in and of itself. But it, <laughs> it was based on, it was kind of based on, um, I don't know, Magic's right term, but he had different armies. Like the yeah. initial setup of Chess, like you might have two queens, yeah. but then maybe you don't have, maybe you have half as many pawns. Like it was yeah. kind of based off. You know, he's, he's a, a fighting game designer primarily, right. so he was thinking of the, the different, making sort of asymmetrical chess. Yeah, it's kind of fun because when I've been doing this, the comments that I will get on YouTube and stuff a lot, is like a lot of people have played around with right. variations of chess. It's such a popular game. Sure. It's such a well-known <laughs> game. It's such a clean, brilliant game. Uh, and so then all of a sudden people start sending me link, like there's a board game, Summoner Wars, that I haven't played. Oh yeah, um, Summoner Wars is good. Right, and and, uh, and then someone was showing me, I can't remember what it was called, but it was a version of chess where you move a piece and then you move a tile. And so you can oh, so move change off, the board or change of? the board yeah, as you go that's and cool. like that. So the board's and, kind of decaying as you're yeah, playing. Yeah, and it's really inspiring to see all this kind of stuff. You know? right, it's right. Like, it, I don't know. I find it really fun to sit. It's almost like those people, instead of being like, oh, this is just like my idea, but different, they're like excited about like another version yeah. of it that like they sure. could play and stuff. Just like I'm excited when they tell me about these things. And so I guess briefly, you, you call it Chess the Gathering. So what <laughs> did you play Magic? And if, if so, what kind of, um, in what way are you bringing in Magic? So in? everyone's going to hate me as a Magic player because I actually didn't play Magic when it was big. I always wanted to, but I didn't have any friends that played. And I worried that it was a game kind of like you're saying with board games where you know, you walk in and you're trying to learn it yourself. You need like that friend right, that just walks right. you through it. Uh, and then when it came out on Xbox, right, uh, I started playing because I had a, I had a friend in Santa Barbara who sure. had played a lot. So, just so we started playing and start there, playing. Yeah. and we started rocking on them. We got really into it, and I was like, "Wow, this is a really cool game." So then we actually bought physical cards. This is exactly what I'm talking about—the digital world bringing us back into like a physical medium. And we tried to play that, and it took us like 45 minutes, and we're arguing. Because <laughs> like, video games automating yes, certain they sticky totally points. Do. Like, we're thinking this game is like, you know, it's going to take us 15 to 20 minutes and no one's going to argue. We're sitting there like at each other's throats and it's like, what does it mean if it's kicked but you interrupted before I, you know? You know, there, there are games that really benefit from rule lawyering. Um, like those really complicated strategy board games where, you know, the rule book has two pages just on the combat sequence and the timing right. structure. And like, yeah. there's people who really get off on that whole thing. They do, um, they do. My brother, most games that my brother and I play over Christmas that are board games, 
like end in some way over some kind of rule argument. <laughs> it's ridiculous. And it becomes such a stalemate that like neither is like we're just like, alright, like one of us will be like, let's keep playing and just you have your way. And then the Someone other has one to give feels it. like they conceded just for that reason and right, it's just right. okay. <laughs> I think it's a beautiful thing. It is. It is in its own way. Like I, I like Holly looks at us and she doesn't understand. I'm like, this is just a thing. This is what we do. So I wanted to also talk about your other project. Um, which actually, I'm sorry, I'm the name it, is... I'm calling it Scavenger. These Scavenger, are all completely right. temp names. So he, he will get some screenshots of that up pretty soon. But that one, I just you just posted the video a few right. days ago. Right. And uh, that game, I mean, has me personally really excited. I think there's a lot of really cool possibilities in that I as well. I think so. Holly and I, and some of the people that we've shown it to, have been really excited by this one. Um, this was one that I kind of came up with, and I wasn't going to paper prototype it. Um, but because I had paper prototype Chess the Gathering, right. a friend of mine who isn't a programmer asked me, like, he was asking me about a design for a so game. So really quick, like, explain what this is, just because that's pretty <laughs> abstract. This is Scavenger, and that's a spaceship. That's, it's a spaceship docked, It's a spaceship right? docked on a, uh, on a, on basically like a derelict spaceship. Right. And you're basically kind of like a Tomb Raider in a way, like you're just going into loot because you owe a lot of money to some not so great people. And you send in drones, and the idea is, is that you gotta switch back and forth your focus between these drones that explore the space. Uh, so that has like a dungeon crawler like atmosphere where you're going through and you're looting, right? Right, right. We layer on top of that. So here's the paper version. Yeah, this is the paper prototype. So that looks very dungeon crawler, right? Yeah, I mean um, that, that looks like a board game right there to me. Yeah, it, and it and that's the thing. I wasn't gonna do this. Right. Uh, but hope, let me explain the game first. So yeah. then, so then the, it has this tower. <laughs> this is gonna sound weird, but it has this tower defense element. The rolling tower defense is like as Holly called it actually where you, it's kind of like Delta Squad. You bring your drones in, and then from the command center, you can open up a door, right? And it kind of uh, felt to me almost like Aliens. Either Aliens, the second See, one... See, now you're getting into... If people in our audience are watching, now you have right, their attention. Now we've got the natural selection vibe yeah, going, right? There you so go. <laughs> I was kind of thinking of Aliens when you had all those screens of all the Marines going through. Mm. Um, so I'm thinking you're in this control room, and you're controlling things, right? right. But, but you're also remote controlling these drones. Uh, and so, and I was also thinking of Alien 1, where he's walking through the pipe and you're closing doors behind him to making sure there are pinch points and stuff. Right. Uh, so I was like, how cool would it be if some of the drones could be set up as turrets, right? They, and then what happens is you have this almost tower defense where you set them all up and then you open the door. Out rushes some bad things. And if they get back to your spaceship, because you're nice and frail as a human, yeah, you're all or whatever you are, you're all fleshy and, and yummy. Yeah. If they get back there, then you're dead. Right. right. So your drones are basically protecting you. That's an interesting balance of sort of um, attack and defense because you're yes. trying to progress in. Yes. It's not just tower defense, which is like in the most cases is purely defense type yes. thing. You are trying to progress through. And so it sounds like the gameplay um, might also involve sort of um, I guess non tower defense elements where yeah. you go into a room and attack and right. clear out and maybe there's a puzzle or something. So this is so then the the last layer on top and you can't see from this in the last uh, picture there was like this ABC and you saw like these wires. Right. The last element it's kind of because the game originally I was thinking of a puzzle game but like imagine if the different areas of the ship don't have power. Right. And your drones have different upgrades and one of your drones an upgrade you can put on him is he's basically a mobile generator. Right, so he plugs himself in to the to to the ship, and he powers that area, and then all of a sudden you might find consoles, and those consoles might have things like, oh, you can scan to see if there are enemies ahead, or turn off life support to kill those enemies before you get there. But you've got to juggle the power because all because you can't turn off life support in that area unless that area is powered as well. So right. like, depends on how many drones you have that are generators, and that's why I was thinking this could be have some kind of roguelike elements where sure. basically. You know, you might go into a ship, and you might not have enough generators to fully explore that ship, or something like that. So you might back out of that. You might back out of that, and that's okay. Sure. You know, and maybe we could make it so that you could come back to it later. And you can. So that kind of layers on like a little area of like you as the player are also the guy in the ship, opening and closing the doors. And opening and closing the doors can also be strategy as well, tower defense wise, because it might be that like you can create pinch points or create longer paths that enemies have to travel. Um, and maybe some enemies like can't go through, can open up doors, but they can't open up a door that isn't powered because they're not strong enough. And maybe some can bust through that, but maybe you have, you know, welding sure. torches or whatever. I was just so, thinking, it's, yes. welding is going to come up, right? Yeah, welding, welding has is always to come a up. thing in these types of games. Yeah, so like <laughs> it, that would be like, don't weld, 
Don't wield a pinch boy that doesn't let your drones get back to your ship at the end. Because right. Then you lose all those drones. And I think that that's going to be another that, that thing. That was always a fun thing in Killing 4. I don't know if you played Killing 4, but mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a survival game, like sort of a zombie game. But they, they had welding doors. You just kind of held the thing and the door would weld. Right. The zombies could break through eventually. Um, but there was those moments where, like, you have one guy welding the door, and then all of a sudden a big rush comes from another point. Right. And now you gotta quickly unweld un to, get, to get through there, which, and then you have, like, you're just surrounded by zombies, and right. it's a good game. Yeah, and I think that kind of tension, I think this game lends itself also to atmosphere, mm -hmm. where, like, we could have it so that, like, you know, pulses are going out so that you can only see, like, echolocation at first with your scanning. I so see. it kind you of have feels primitive like. tools in it and then get in there. And right, the, and it kind of feels like, details. you know, a little bit creepy. And right. So this, this is. Very early in development, Very early. <laughs> and yeah. so uh, you're you're just prototyping these things mm -hmm. out. Do, do you have a like a project you know you're going to be working on, or is it is it just you're focusing on these prototypes initially right now? Well, we're doing right. So we're porting uh, a virus named Tom over to the Vita right. um, and the PSM devices. So that's kind of taking up a little bit of our you know development time. And then in, in our in our uh, in our kind of after time, uh, we're we're prototyping. So we're trying to do three prototypes. And uh, because when we did a virus named Tom, it was just like, let's make this game. And, you know, it ends up being like a, you know, a year and a half, two year commitment, you know, for an indie dev. So now we're like, hey, let's prototype a couple, put them out to our community who we love. And then also feel after making the digital prototypes ourselves, if we like it or not. Sure. And then uh, and then get a feel from that. So and that's why this game and this game, I, uh, Scavenger, I didn't think we could paper prototype, or I didn't think to paper prototype it. And this is, this is, are you playing like a single player game right now? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, so that's a single player, and like, but it seems like this does lend itself to paper prototype, and I would have, yeah, it, it, totally, it just really based does. on what I've seen. It really does, because at first I was thinking of all the real time elements, right. right? And then all of a sudden I broke it down and I said, instead of worrying about this game being perfect for a board game, like what if I can break down the core elements, which are dungeon crawling, uh, that rolling tower defense, um, and then this, like, you know, turning on and off power. Sure, like the Just, hacking thing. Yeah, all this stuff is completely, like, I put down little pieces that are the terminals yeah, and yeah. what they are. And Holly and I played through, and it really informs us to the game. Because I thought at first, I was like, oh, you're only going to need, you know, you only have a couple of drones. And then I realized, like, if you're six doors in, and you want to set up a really good gauntlet for some crazy things that are going to happen, you need, like, way more drones than that. Right. So it's like, it just immediately informs you. And I, ironically, I wasn't even going to do the paper prototype, and I told a friend, because he wasn't really a programmer, and I'm like, rather than worrying about hiring programmers or whatever, I'm like, make a board game, because the game he was describing to me sounded very paper prototypable. <laughs> <laughs> Unlike Tom, which isn't, and our third sure. prototype idea is not. Um, but then all of a sudden I was like, we could probably prototype Scavenger. And I was on tilt, because we had just spray painted all these pieces for Chess the Gathering <laughs> and made our little Lego things. And so like, like I don't know how to do this. We could we Yeah, could we were having we were having way too much fun with it. So we were like, we gotta do this again. And it's pretty fun. So I just have one final question for you. Um, what is one game you think everyone should play? I feel like James Lipton on Inside Actor Studio. <laughs> I want to have like the you know Will Ferrell when he does this gets he has the right. huge stack index cards. I want I feel like that right so now. So this is an interesting like question because this question isn't this isn't like what is one what's like the best game I've ever played, but a game that everyone should play. Yeah, maybe uh, maybe it's you know a game that I, and I should, I did say a game that everyone I well I wrote it down here a game that everyone should play once at least once. So maybe it's not even a good game. But right. <laughs> yeah, but so I mean I guess I would I guess I would hearken back to Zelda, and I mean that's just just a typical response. But the thing and I think I find this in a lot of my games is that Zelda is this mashup of several different styles of game, I feel. Like, I feel like it's an, an action-adventure game. I feel like it's an RPG, right? right? And I feel it's a puzzle game, right? And a lot of my games, I end up, like a virus named Tom, I end up mashing up mechanics. Um, and you look at some games where they seem so divorced, like ActRaiser is a game that I loved, and basically you go down, you play a side-scroller, and then you play a SimCity-style game. And it was, they were so disjoint, the game was so fun. Did but they feed into each other pretty they well? They fed into each other pretty well, but they were pretty... They, even yeah. despite that, they felt yeah. a little bit disjoint. Sure. But like in Zelda, it's just like they're all merged in, and I think it's almost like I had to stop and think about it to peel out those layers of it. Um, and so I feel that not only is it a great game, and like pretty much the whole series kind of goes along this same step, right? Like where it's like there is RPG elements where you're, you know, you're getting new swords and new equipment and stuff like that, and then there's... Uh, like a lot of story-driven RPG stuff, then there's the adventure where you're fighting, and then usually when you're fighting a boss or you're in a dungeon, that's when the puzzle elements come out. Even every boss fight is kind of a puzzle. 
because you have to figure out what their weakness is, right. and it's this, and but that's mixed with action and adventure and stuff like that. So I think it's a really good example from a game designer standpoint of like merging a bunch of mechanics well and not making them feel like they're different modes of a game. Sure, um, it's all cohesive. Yeah, and I just love the crap out of that game. Sure. So. <laughs> I don't think you're alone there. That was, that was a nice safe one. Yeah. I'll come on again sometime, <laughs> and I'll just pick one that's really controversial. No, that was good. I should have said um, natural selection, too. Right? You should have. Now, now I don't get to come That would have been the, the right answer, you know? <laughs> that would have got us more tweets or whatever, um, which is why we're doing this. So, yeah, I guess that, that's all we had for now. I wanted to keep it at about half an hour, so we're about there. Awesome. So I hope people enjoyed this, and it was fun. And I enjoyed it. That's what's important. So we're, we're planning on doing this um, about once a month. Um, oh, cool. Yeah, I, I might have someone lined up for next month. and So we're going to try and keep doing it. It's pretty casual, just like half an hour a month. and Yeah, so maybe at some point you'll come back. And yeah, no, I'd your, love to. With your, uh, your finished show. That together. would be really cool. <laughs> show, show like how it came together. Yeah, or just you know show, show a quick game, of, a quick round of chess together. Yes, that would be fun. <laughs> All right, thanks for watching. Oh, is there a question in the stream for Q&A? Q&A. Okay, well, let's, yeah. let's do just like a few questions. Five minutes, yeah. Sure. Ooh. Um, yeah, so we already. It was, I haven't. This is my first live streaming. Oh, okay. Like where? So yeah, that like, camera. It's not really camera. That is ten thousand people right there. I expect there's at least ten thousand people. At watching. least. Yeah. I have no idea, but I think that's the. So what's the first question? Uh, just give it thirty seconds for them to float. Okay, they're floating up. Yes. So, so what is your game that you think everyone should play? Oh, I've, I see it. That thing changes depending <laughs> what game I'm playing right now. Right now, I've just been playing the hell out of Netrunner, the collectible card. It's not collectible anymore, but the card game, and that's the game that... I've know, heard a lot about that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's awesome. We play it all the time. But, you know, that, that's just because that's just I've been playing it recently. Like, right. probably a, who knows? That'll change every <coughs> month for me. What do we got? Tim, would you recommend using Unity to make game prototypes? So they said, would you recommend using Unity to make game prototypes? Right. And so this is the thing is, is that we hadn't used Unity. This is another reason for us prototyping, is for us to figure out new technologies. Because we used XNA for a virus right. named Tom, which we loved. Um, but we started looking at other technologies that we might want to try. So this is our first foray into Unity. And it began, I think, as every game I ever play does and everything I ever do does, with a lot of swearing and a lot of like, this thing. Argh. Um, so at the beginning, I didn't really like it, and then and then now that we're kind of getting into it, right. there's a lot of niceties about it. I think one of the really good niceties about it, even though like you know I'm old school and I was just like, what is this editor and all this stuff? I just want to run the game. Um, give, me, give me code. Give yeah. Me, give me the text. Notepad.exe is all I need. <laughs> yes. What is this colorized code? But like, uh, but that really allowed us to quickly like we were having trouble deciding how the pieces should look because you have to modify these pieces and you have to make that look right. Your original or, prototype, you put Legos, Legos underneath. underneath yeah, right? so you'd have a red Logo underneath it. Yeah. Like, spell. So we actually yeah. did that in the digital version. Uh, like okay. we actually have like modeled out Legos. <laughs> yeah, we modeled out Legos so we could get sued even more. I got that. <laughs> but uh, but so anyway, when I did that. Instead of coding it up, I was able to easily go into the editor, just like you would in Maya or 3D Studio or whatever, and just put them underneath, bring the camera back, see it in the actual environment with all the other pieces there, like pause the game and put that in there, which like was kind of mind blowing for me because right. I was used to having to you know put in a bunch of code, then rerun, it, wait for it to link load it up. up. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that was really fast. So I think with all of the visual stuff. It was really, really fast and really, really effective. Yeah, so and maybe then, like yeah. it took a little bit of time to get to, to learn it, but now that you know right. it, it's Yeah, and it's kind of, advantages. the way that the code is, is it's a little bit different because you kind of hang it off objects and they've got this really strategy pattern like way of doing it. Yeah. But now, now strategy it's Strategy pattern, you're getting design yeah. pattern -y on me now. <laughs> yes, right. It's just this, you know, you be careful with modular. that, we'll have to kick you out of here. Right? <laughs> Uh, so, uh, the, so the, the shorter version of this long-winded answer is, is that now I'm starting to see all the benefits of rapid prototyping in Unity. Sure. So I would, I would at this point say it would be a good, good thing if you wanted to rapid. Yeah, especially for prototyping. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. I know Charlie here has been doing some home projects in Unity, right. and he's been getting a lot out of it. Yeah, Steve yeah. uses a lot too on his projects. Um, so another question says, if you, in parentheses, Brian. So I think that's me. And Tim could work together and make any game. What would it be? I don't. We've not really talked about this. But any game, I would bet you money it would be a board game because we always whenever about, we talk, we start talking about board games. You know, I'm thinking like just in terms of profit. What if we beat them to it? Minecraft two. Oh, 
That would probably be... We do it in like a month. Yeah. Beat, beat him to the chase. In Unity. In Unity. Put up Minecraft 2. Right. We have a board game version to go along with it. And we, yeah. They work together. You have to, you have to buy both. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, you and can't it, play one without the and other. And it deletes Minecraft from your computer because <laughs> you you already have Minecraft. Too. <laughs> the board game would it would have a piece that would have to be scanned in so then you oh, could get your three D printing and the future is uh, <laughs> Minecraft Two by Brian and Tim. Yes, I think that would be no. But honestly, I think whenever I've geeked out with you about game design, we right. start bringing up board games, and I think maybe it's because we talk so much video games. Uh, just being game designers and being game makers, like that's what we do so much, and I love that. But like, uh, but that kind of, you know, I think we grew up and still play board games a lot, and you can see the the cleanness of some of the design in board right. games and out of necessity a lot of times. Yes, and so that's what's kind of fun. That's I think why I'm making the. Paper yeah, you you have um, talked about wanting to participate in a game jam. Yes, and we haven't figured out when. It's probably going to be later in the year at this point, but we are going to host a board game jam that would be really over fun. a weekend. We did it last year here in the offices, and it was pretty successful. Um, at least, you know, we all made some games that were maybe not great, but they, they were yeah. they were games, and it was fun, so That's, maybe you'll, you'll join us just, for that. Yeah, it's really fun. Holly might actually join for that, because, cool. like, she, I think we enjoy, like, when it's like, how do we solve this we're not. There's no computer. Like, yeah, yeah. How do we solve this and glue this and paste <laughs> this? It's a and physical spray. thing. Yeah. It's this fun. There's a tactile. Yeah, thing you're like, you don't need tokens. Well, I'm just gonna fold paper eight times on top of each other. Right. Tape it all up, and there's a token. Yeah, it's just fun. I think. All right, Hugh. Is that uh, is that good for now? Okay. Cool. So I think we'll sign off then. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Thanks for watching. This is fun. And mu thank music you, plays sir. now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I think we're off. All right. Thank you, sir. It was yeah. fun. No, thank you. Okay, thank you. All right. <laughs> I assume it's all off and done. But you never know with you.